Amen. Amen. Thanks, Al. Appreciate that. Good morning, everybody. How are you? You guys are good? Oh, I'm good. Thank you. So <laughs> I like the interaction. Feel free to uh, shout anything out that are, that are nice. Don't shout mean things to me. Um, shout mean things to Al, not to me. Um, also want to welcome everyone watching online. We know there's a bunch of you that, that join us online. Um, so we're, we're grateful that you, you're here uh, worshiping with us wherever you are on your phone or maybe at the beach even. So, <laughs> so as Al said, we've been in a series um, called Jesus is Better. And we've been going through the book of Hebrews. And, and we're going to be, as Al said, um, things are repeated a lot. And that's actually a good thing. Right? When you see things repeated, don't be like, oh, man, I already read this. Be like, oh, is God saying something? Because, you know, if you have kids and, you know, you have to repeat yourself over and over and over again, it's like the same thing. And so we're going to jump in in a really cool passage um, in Hebrews chapter 8. So if you have your Bible open, um, that's where we'll be. But before I jump in, I want to tell you about um, this passage I read from a book called The Reason for God. And it was written by a uh, former pastor of a church in New York City called Tim Keller. And in it, he was talking, there's a lot of people that come, they used to come to, or they still come to his church, and um, they don't know Jesus, they, they're not really familiar with the church, and so um, this one woman, the story is about this one woman who came to his church, and sat under his teaching, small groups, discipleship, um, relationship, just to get to know about this Jesus they're talking about, and after a little while, she became aware of this distinction that she didn't know about between religion and the gospel. All right. Basically, this idea between doing things for God to, to get God's favor and this idea of grace where you can't do anything but receive the things that God wants to give you, salvation, forgiveness, eternal life. And, and as she was kind of contemplating these two different things, um, she had a conversation with Pastor Tim, and um, she said that th this, new, this new distinction, this new message was actually kind of scary for her. Right? It was scary, and they asked, like, why? Why? And so she said, like, if I'm saved by the things I do, if I'm saved by the works that I do throughout the week, throughout my life, then there's kind of a limit on what God could ask of me, Right? There's a limit of what he put me through because it's kind of like I'm, I'm, I'm paying my dues, right? It's kind of like I'm like almost like a taxpayer and I, I do what God wants and I make him happy and, and then, you know, I, I have rights. I, I would have done my duty and now I should have a certain quality of life that I want or I should be able to get something because I did, I did all these things, God, so, so give it to me. But if this system of religion isn't real, and this, this idea that I'm someone who messed up, I'm a sinner, I've done things against what God had wanted, and I'm only saved by his grace, meaning I can't do anything. He, he just gives it to me. I just have to receive. If that's true, and this woman said, there's nothing that God can't ask of me. There's nothing God can't ask of me because she realized when I am just fully at God's mercy and his grace, and he gives that to me. What can't I give back to him? He's given me life. So I should give my life to him. And as, you know, we sit here, many of us in this room have, would profess and say, yeah, I, I love Jesus. I follow him with all my heart. That we've accepted God's grace in our lives. That, that at, maybe at some point we realize that, just like this woman, I'm a sinner in need of God's grace. And so we've, we've given our life to him and we've received that. But practically on a day-to-day -day basis, for one reason or another, we find ourselves trying to be good for God rather than depending on this grace that is given to us. We, we do good things as we're supposed to, right? Because the Bible tells me so. It's the song we sang when we were little. And just like that woman was describing, it, it creeps into our, I don't know if we'd ever say this out loud, but it might creep into our hearts and in our minds that like, well, well, God, you should give me some stuff, right? I served in LH Kids, and God, you know what those toddlers are like, so God, you owe me something. <laughs> or, or, or God, you, you know, I did what you said. Don't I deserve some of the good things? And again, we might not vocalize this. 
but it's something in our hearts that begins to take hold and grow. We begin to feel entitled and comfortable and, and want our needs met. When in actuality, everything, the very breath that I breathe, is a result of God's grace in my life. And so as we're looking at Hebrews chapter 8, the author wants to make a distinction here. Because remember, he's talking to people that love Jesus, that, that have given their lives to him, Jewish people that have given their lives to him, that follow him in faith, but they're facing a persecution. And then they're facing a temptation to put that faith aside. Or, or maybe not even aside, but to, to kind of fall back into a way of living, a way of thinking, a religious life that they once knew. And so in chapter 8, he begins in verse 1, he says this. Now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by mere, not by a mere human being. All right, and so this is the repetitive part that we talked about. If you have no idea what we're talking about in the, in the last few weeks, I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel, hit like, hit subscribe, hit the bell. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, go, seriously, go to our YouTube channel. We've had a lot of great um, sermons on this. I kind of give you some background on what we're going to be talking about today. But in, in summary, what he's saying, what I've been saying the last few chapters is this. My, my main point is this, that we have a high priest. And actually, our high priest, who's Jesus, is better than the one that came before him. He has better access to God. The high priest used to serve, and there was a group of them, they would serve in this tent in the middle of this dirty camp. But Jesus is actually sitting at God's right hand right now. And he's actually serving in a tabernacle that's better than the one that the priests on earth are, are serving in right now. And so he's saying this thing that Jesus is doing, this new thing that he is inaugurating, is better than what came before. And he explains it this way, starting in verse 3. He says, Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he, if Jesus were on earth, he wouldn't be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They, meaning the earthly priests, they serve at a sanctuary that's a copy and a shadow of what's in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build a tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Meaning, so if you go back to the book of Exodus, um, the people of Israel have just been taken out of Egypt. They're free for the first time in 400 years. And God says, hey, I'm going to give you some blueprints for this tent I want you to make, and this is where I'm going to live with you. It's called a tabernacle. But, but you've got to make it exactly how I'm telling you how to do it. Like, no, 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 you know, carpenters, freedom here to kind of put a little this or that on it. No, it's like, make it exactly. Why? Because it's a mirror, it's a copy, it's a shadow. It's not as good, but it's a shadow of this tabernacle that's in heaven. And then he says this in verse 6. He says, in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs, as the superior to this old religious system, as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. So this idea of covenant, covenant is just a fancy word for these promises that God made, this relationship that they were in. So back, we're going to go back in time a little bit. The Israelites come out of Egypt. Um, God says, all right, you're gonna, you're, I'm gonna, you're gonna be your God, you're gonna be my people, but there's some things we gotta get clear how this relationship's gonna work. So I want you guys to um, to make these sacrifices regularly. Because, you know, you, when you sin, you have to pay the penalty for that, right? And we get that. Modern times, we get that. If someone were to come up to someone in your family, just pop them in the face, you'd be like, yo. <laughs> like, you would want to pop them back. You get this idea of justice, right? And so when we sin against a holy God, he says, uh, you have to pay the price for what you just did. That's not okay. And, and so in the Old Testament, the price was paid by these animals. So every year, and actually uh, more often than that, they would take these animals and they would sacrifice them. And that animal would die in the place of the person 
once a year they would do these, this big, big um, sacrificial service which they'd sacrifice a bunch of these animals and, and they would um, cover for the sin, pay for the sins of all the people. He says that um, if, you, if you follow my laws, I'm going to live with you. I'm going to be, I'm going to have a presence. Actually, he's going to, God would live in this tabernacle, this tent in the middle of their camp. And, and he says, I'm going to, I'm going to put you in this promised land I give you, this land called Canaan. And if you, if you ever read um, the book of Joshua, it talks, Exodus and Joshua, they talk about um, um, what Canaan's about. They, they describe it as a land flowing with milk and honey. We can think about it as a land flowing with like Chick-fil-A. Right? <laughs> like, there's tons of, like, peach milkshakes and, and nuggets for everybody, right? And, and it's just, like, this place where, like, they're, they're fulfilled, they have everything they need, and they can just rest. Right? They can just rest. And, he's, and the author of, take a step back, the author of Hebrews is saying, this is the old covenant. But this thing that Jesus is doing is actually superior to what you guys had been doing. It's, it's established because it's established on better promises. So the natural question is from, from verse 6 is, what are the better promises? What does he mean? What are the better promises that this, this new thing, this new covenant, these new promises, what are these promises established on, right? And we've seen them throughout the past few chapters. Right, the new covenant promises better rest. While it's nice to be in this land for as long as I'm alive, 80, 90 years with Chick-fil-A, it's better that I have eternity with God. I have intimacy with God. I have eternal life. I, I can be in this land that's really nice where I can have eternity with a father who loves me. He, he says that the new covenant promises better rest through a better sacrifice. right? And, and so... In this old covenant, we would continually kill these animals over and over and over again. And while it was good that our sins could be paid for, it's something I would have to keep doing. And actually, the system got messed up. You remember in the Gospels where Jesus goes in and he, he flips a table over, and the money goes all over the place, and the animals are all over the place. The whole idea was there was animals in that temple area because they were selling the sacrificial animals to the people that were traveling. They were actually cheating them. That's why it was, it was wrong. And, and so he's saying these sacrifices that you have to do, while good in the past, we have something better. Well, well, there might have been a perfect lamb that we would sacrifice here. Now we have the perfect son of God who has given his life willingly, one sacrifice for all. I don't have to sacrifice anymore. You don't have to sacrifice anymore. You don't need to sacrifice anymore. Jesus sacrificed one time for all. The covenant, the new covenant is based on a better sacrifice, served by a better high priest. Someone who, as we talked about, is sitting directly at the hand, right hand of the Father. Now, what does that mean? That means he has better access. That means when you're struggling through some persecution, maybe you're struggling through a broken relationship, a broken marriage, maybe you're just struggling because you, you don't have finances, um, because maybe you lost a job, or, or things are just, inflation's happening, things are really expensive, and you're struggling, or, or maybe you're, you're just like making bad choices and you're struggling with sin and you're trying to stop but you can't and you have someone that's literally sitting, I mean, can, have you ever just sat and like, I wish God was here with me right now. I, I wish God could just see what I'm going through, could help me out, that he'd understand what I'm going through. Let me tell you, Jesus, our big brother, is actually sitting right next to God's side. He's saying, I, I want you to see Jason. I, I want you to see Christy. I want you to see Laura because they're going through something right now. I want you to see them. God, I want you to forgive them. They're on their knees. They're begging you for forgiveness. See them and forgive them. God, they're struggling through that broken relationship right now. Empower them with your spirit, our spirit, to, to give them what they need to be able to provide love and to, to create something new in this broken relationship. God, they're struggling financially. I want you to see them and, and give them contentment with what they have. Let them know that even when they don't have anything, they can still trust and praise you because you will provide for them. We have a high priest that's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And this new covenant is facilitated by a better mediator. A better mediator. What does that mean? Someone who is 
mediating or, 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 or making sure that this covenant, these promises are working out amongst the parties. Now check this out because this is really cool because Jesus as our mediator represents God to us perfectly. Right? He represents God to us because he's God's son. And so if we ever wanted to know what God might be thinking, if we ever wanted to know what God might be thinking about us, how he, he would want us to live, how he, how he feels about us, we look to his son Jesus, the mediator, and say, oh, that's what he's thinking of me. Uh, but also on the, on, on the other side, Jesus represents us to God. Being fully human, he knows what it's like to be us in a broken and fallen world, yet he did not sin, but now he sits at the Father's right hand. He's like, it's hard. You put me down there. It's hard. You give them the grace that they need, God. Give them the grace they need. This new covenant is facilitated by a better mediator because the Old Testament priests couldn't do that. All they can do is offer sacrifices and pray. So these better promises that the new covenant are established on, rest, sacrifice, a better high priest, a better mediator. And it was better because when you look at the, the scope of the Old Testament, when you look at the scope, and I know the Old Testament can be difficult sometimes to, to, to read and go through because it's long, and there's weird laws and stuff, and then there's a bunch of weird names that everyone has a trouble reading. But if you look at the scope of the Old Testament over and over again, it's just a story of God's people and their relationship with God. It's a relationship with God with these Israelites. And he, he tells them that if you obey my laws, if you follow me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength, I'll be your God and you'll be my people. And the, the people, when they, were, when they were offered this, 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 this relationship, the people were just like, yeah, let's go. We're doing it. Me and my family, we will serve the Lord. But as you read the story over and over and over again, there's a lot of God's people failing. You read in the Samuels and the Kings in the Old Testament, it talks about king after king not having a heart that loves the Lord. There's a few, there's a David here and there, there's a, 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 a Jehoshaphat every now and then that, that loves the Lord. But for the most part, it's kings that are just like, ah, uh, they're just not following through on their promise to God to love him with all his heart. And, and so God sent prophets to them, prophet after prophet, and it's always just like the Old Testament is like, I want you to turn back to God. Maybe you're not a, a narrative history person. Maybe you're like a poetic, artsy person. Well, the, the, the Psalms are filled with these these, these passionate pleas like, God, God, I, I've sinned against you. I've tried to follow you, but I sinned, and people are trying to crush me. It's this idea that as God's people got into this relationship with God, they couldn't follow through with this old covenant. This is how the author of Hebrews describes it. In verse 7, he says, For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place, or, or meaning no circumstance or no occasion, would have been sought for another covenant. But God found fault with the people, not the covenant, with the people, and said, the days are coming, declares the Lord, I'll make a new covenant. I'll make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the, wrong, declares the Lord. What was wrong with this first covenant, this old covenant? Now, I want to be careful here, because the covenant wasn't evil. Uh, the covenant lacked power. Uh, the covenant gave the law, and God saying, love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, the people knew the law, they knew it was beautiful, they knew it was good, they knew it was kind, but they were unable to follow it for the most part. Because the law reveals God's goodness, but it also reveals our sinfulness. What does that mean? This is how the Apostle Paul says it. I don't have a slide for this, but this is from Romans 7, verse 7 and 8 and 10. It says, I, Paul's saying this himself, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. 
If God didn't write down on tablets of stone the Ten Commands, I wouldn't have known what sin was. It says, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet it. I wouldn't have known what committing adultery was if it said, don't commit adultery. I wouldn't have known what it meant to worship other gods as if it said, don't worship other gods. Verse 8 says, but sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. So what that's saying is, as God wrote his laws down, and now I know what sin is, oh boy, there is something inside of me that's like, I want to do it. I know what coveting is now. Now there's something inside me that says, I want to do it. I want that Mustang that's out in the parking lot. I want that one wheel that Harrison's driving around every now and then outside. I want, I want, I want. I want power. I want money. I want influence. I want comfort. I want all these things that the law is telling me is not good. It turns out that the law, which God meant to give him glory first and foremost, and for our flourishing as people, when we have it on our own, it actually brings death. Because I'm trying to follow this, but I really can't. And Paul goes on in Romans 7, he says, I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. And so in this old covenant, God's people were supposed to be his people and God, their God, but he turned away from them because the people were unable to follow God with all their heart. And that's sometimes where we find ourselves, right? We say we profess and we we trust in God's grace, but something happens in our heart and we just try to follow the law. Maybe we forgot our first love and and we just try to be religious and we just try to do things. And if I show up on a Sunday and I should maybe show up in a small group or if I serve on a team, if I read my Bible at home, at least the majority of the week, at least four times, so it's more days than not reading it. If I do X, Y, Z, God's going to help me out with my kids who don't like me anymore. And we fall into this old system of religiosity, and it only brings death in our lives. This is what the author of Hebrews says in verse 10. This is the covenant, this new covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. What's the difference between this old covenant and this new covenant that Jesus is establishing? Instead of God's law, which is good, instead of it being written on stone or on scrolls, he says, I'm going to write it on your hearts. I'm going to write it on your minds. And the point of this is so that not only do we know the law and that we know God, but we actually can follow it and live for him. God hasn't written his law on stones, but on your hearts if you've put your faith and trust in him. He goes on and says in verse 11, no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they'll all know me from the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. He says, they will all know me. And this idea of the word know relates a relationship between God and his people. Because you can read on some tablets, or you can read this, and you can know a lot about God. You can know his laws left and right, backwards and forwards but not have a relationship with God, not have intimacy with God. In 
the Old Testament or in the New Testament time around Jesus' time, they were known as Pharisees. They knew a lot about the law. They actually knew a lot more than any of us would know about the law, but there was no life in it because they had no relationship with God. But here, the word know connotates this idea of intimacy with God. They'll have We'll have God's law in our hearts. We'll have God's law in our minds. And we will know God intimately. It's actually this, this phrase that is this idea that like a husband and wife know each other intimately. That we can have that kind of relationship with the God of heaven. If anyone ever says to you, I don't understand where it talks about a relationship with God in the Bible. This is what he's talking about. That you can know God when you enter into this new covenant through Jesus Christ. And he says, our sins will be forgiven. They won't be remembered. He's wiping the slate clean. Once and for all. No more sacrifices year after year. Once and for all. Verse 13 ends this, our passage today. It says, by calling this covenant new, he's made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated soon disappear. And so the author of Hebrews is telling the people that are reading this, the Jewish believers, he's saying, if you're facing persecution and you think doing stuff will con magically conjure something from God to help you out, that system's outdated, old, and obsolete. What he wants to do is he wants to give you his grace upon grace upon grace. So when you face temptation, you don't try harder. You lean in harder to your relationship with Jesus. Like, God, give me what I need, and he will give you grace. When, when you're facing a financial struggle, he's not saying don't, don't just try to do things and, and make things happen like I'm going to give you a bunch of cash. I want you to lean into my relationship. I will give you grace upon grace upon grace so that regardless of what you're struggling with right now, you can find contentment and do all things through Christ who strengthens you. A relationship, a job, broken marriage, kids that don't talk to you anymore. Whatever it is you're facing right now, he's saying, come to me, I have grace to give you. They were tempted to abandon their faith. For, for us, there's this temptation to trade in God's grace for our own good works. And I, I'm gonna, I want to share one quote with you, a short quote. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up as I do that. Um, Dr. Herschel York, he's the dean of theology, um, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, has gave this short quote that I found. It says, the temptation is not to do bad things. I mean, there is temptation to do bad things, but in this context, the temptation isn't to do bad things, but to trust in good things, the law, and miss the best thing, God's grace. Or the, the temptation is not to do bad things, but to, to trust in good things, to live over here in the old covenant. God, if, if I go to church enough this fall, maybe you'll love me. God, if, if I pray enough at home, Maybe, maybe you'll fix my financial situation. And he's saying, while following the law is good, God didn't abolish the law. God didn't say that this is garbage. and he's at the law, His law is good, but he's actually saying, lean into the relationship I have with you. Accept my grace so that I can give you the power to walk through whatever situation you're going through. You don't need to do anything to earn my love. I love you no matter what. Why? You don't have to do anything to earn my grace. I give it to you freely. And as we close up, I, I want to provide opportunities. I'm going to pray for you as your pastor, but I want to provide an opportunity for you to be able to lay down whatever it is you might be holding on to. To, to be able to lay down the worry, the hurt, the anger, to lay that down and receive God's grace. Because you can't work yourself out of 
these situations and, and, and see if God, maybe he'll see you enough and, and, try, and you do all these things for him and he's going to give you what you want. No, no, he says, I just want to give it to you because I love you. So I want to pray for you. But I want to pray for some of you in this room right now. Maybe you're younger, maybe you're older. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing about God's grace. And he says that if you are to put your faith and trust in him, he'll forgive you of the things that you know deep down that you shouldn't be doing, the things that separate you from him. He'll forgive you for those. He'll give you eternal life. He'll put his spirit in you. He'll write his law in your hearts and he'll give you the power to live that out, to love your family, to love your neighbors, to love God. And so I invite you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna close in prayer, but then uh, me and Pastor Al are gonna be down in the front here. And we just wanna open up this space. I know sometimes it'd be a little weird to come up and receive prayer. We're gonna turn the lights down a little bit so you guys have a little privacy. We're gonna pray, we're just gonna pray. Whatever God's put on your hearts, we just wanna come alongside you as brothers and sisters to pray for you, ask God to intercede for you, ask God to come, empower you, strengthen you, save you, if that's where you're at. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for this new covenant that you've established. Thank you that we don't have to keep trying and working and working and working, trying to earn your favor, earn your love, and earn your grace because you've established something new. We thank you. God, we're, we're helpless without you. We can't deal with the situation we're in right now without you. We can't earn our salvation. And so we need you. God, would you come? Would you forgive our sins? Would you forgive me for what I've been doing? Would you forgive me for trying to make you love me more? And help me know and receive that your love is for me no matter what, unconditionally. God, as we offer up this last song of praise, would you accept it, Lord? May it be an offering that's pleasing to you. Amen.